Can Saudi Arabia get away with murder? The kingdom continues to deny Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman ordered or knew about Jamal Khashoggi's killing. Turkey's president is promising to reveal the, quote, naked truth about what happened in Istanbul. Can the Saudis be pressured to hold a credible investigation? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the programme. I'm Peter Dobby. The naked truth about the killing of Jamal Khashoggi. Turkey's president is vowing to reveal all on Tuesday. Three weeks in and this will be the first official release of the details. Unofficially, Turkish sources have repeatedly leaked gruesome accounts of how the journalist was killed and his body dismembered three weeks ago. He was missing for two weeks before Saudi leaders eventually admitted his killing by mistake inside their consulate in Istanbul. Their story has changed since then. The phrase rogue operation is the latest. What isn't changing is the kingdom's insistence that the Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman did not order any killing. As the international outcry continues, critics are skeptical that the heir apparent didn't know anything about it. We'll get to our guests in just a moment. But first, let's hear now from Turkey's president. We are going to make it clear what happened to Jamal Khashoggi. And God willing, on Tuesday, I will have a group meeting and hopefully by then I'll be able to find out what happened. Because we are looking for justice here. We want simple and straight justice. It will not be achieved by some simple steps. We will make everything clear. Fifteen people came here. Subsequently, eighteen people are arrested or detained. So all these pieces of information need to be clarified. And on Tuesday, I will go into details of this situation. Saudi Arabia's foreign minister says Khashoggi's death was, quote, a huge and grave mistake. Adel al Jubia denied the Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman knew about the operation. The minister telling Fox News, the Crown Prince is not aware of this. Even the senior leadership of our intelligence services were not aware of this. This was an operation that was rogue. The individuals who did this did this outside the scope of their authority. There obviously was a tremendous mistake made, and what compounded the mistake was the attempt to try to cover it up. That was unacceptable in any government. These things unfortunately happen. We want to make sure that those who are responsible are punished. OK, let's get going. Let's bring in our guests today all in Washington. We have Ali Al Ahmed, who's the director of the Gulf Affairs Institute and a former Saudi political prisoner. We'll also be joined by Matthew Brodsky, a senior fellow with the Security Studies Group in DC. And finally on Skype is Mustafa Akyol, senior fellow with the Cato Institute Center for Global Liberty and Prosperity. He's also a contributing writer to the New York Times. Welcome to you all. Ali Al Ahmed, first, if I may come to you, how isolated are they feeling in Riyadh right now? I believe they feel extremely isolated. Uh, uh, for the first time, uh, the uh, Western governments have targeted uh, uh, not uh, the Saudi Arabia in general, but specifically the, the ruling family for criticism. When you see the UK specifically, who has been greatest, the greatest defender of the Saudi monarchy, making such statements, uh, then uh, the, this is a great indicator of the isolation of, of Saudi Arabia. Still, however, the, the country or the, the government feels it has uh, allies within the Arab world, in Egypt and UAE and others, but generally uh, it's in the West its position has, has diminished uh, greatly in the past two weeks. Matthew, coming to you also in Washington, what is it about the Saudi leadership? They don't seem to understand that since day one they've been hemorrhaging credibility with this. Right. Well, I think now that it turns out that they decided to say that they were responsible for it, or at least elements within the government were responsible for it, that it was taking time to figure out exactly how they were going to handle the situation. Um, as far as credibility, certainly it has taken a, a shot as a result of this. I think a lot of the reporting uh, has also taken a shot. Most of the uh, leaks which came out happened to come from state-run news organizations that were uh, that ended up giving out details that happened 
happened to turn out not to be true. Uh, so there was also a way in which uh, other regional governments were, of course, trying to use this crisis in, which, in order to benefit themselves. But, I mean, it, it's a tough situation, clearly, for the kingdom. Mustafa Akiol, as far as the ultimate response is concerned, and we don't know what that will be yet, we're probably several weeks away from that, perhaps months, does that rely on the truth coming from Riyadh? Not Riyadh's truth, not even a truth that's acceptable to Washington, the Trump administration, but the real truth. Well, first of all, let me say that Riyadh taking responsibility in this is not very credible because... Right after the disappearance of Jamal Khashoggi, the first thing they said, four, four days after the incident, the crown prince said, oh, he's, he came in and he left, and you can search the consulate. We are all safe and, you know, we are proud. Nothing, nothing went wrong. So they insisted that there was nothing wrong. And only after weeks of exposures by the Turkish authorities, by the Turkish media, and ultimately, Western media, I mean, going after, 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 they finally had to admit that Jamal Khashoggi was killed on that day. And, but now they are saying, giving us another story, saying that he was accidentally killed and so on and so forth. And I think that's not credible either. And I think we will see the exposure of this second line of defense, if you will, uh, in the days and weeks ahead. I think uh, a lot of people who look at this objectively without falling into the agenda of any government, that be Ankara or Washington or Riyadh, can see that there is really good ground to think that this was a yet another operation to crack down on dissent by the Saudi crown prince and his, his whole establishment, which was the very thing that Jamal Khashoggi was writing about. This was the main reason he was out of Saudi Arabia and he had raised his voice. And that is the main reason he was killed. Ali Al-Ahmed, the more that Donald Trump hardens his stance because he has to, because he has to react towards what, uh, to what people like Mike Pompeo are saying, does that make the powers that be inside the royal palace in Riyadh, does that make them look even more alone? Uh, absolutely. I, I want to make sure that, uh, to point this out, that the uh, President Trump, uh, despite his... Uh, 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 detractors has been the the, uh, the most vocal American president on on, on the Saudi human rights issues in, in relation to this to this case. So no uh, American president before him has even spoken in this way in public and even uh, you know talked about uh, punishment or sanctions and so on. Uh, but uh, his private feelings apparently are also doubting. His public statements, I don't take them uh, at face value sometimes, but I think uh, his private feelings and some of his public statements are making Riyadh fearful that he may turn against them. Uh, let's wait and see, but the, the, this is the greatest American reaction to anything coming out of Saudi Arabia. It's greater than September 11. Uh, and it, it's different because it's targeting the monarchy this time. It's not, talk, it's not blaming the people of the country or the so-called extremists in the country. It now is blaming the monarchy and, in, in, in particular, the, the man in charge of the country, Mohammed bin Salman. And that's Mustafa, Mustafa, would the leadership perhaps feel less isolated if they could point the world towards where the body is, but if we believe the reports, they can't do that because they desecrated the body for a Muslim in the worst possible way. I think so. I mean, I don't think they... I think they said the minimum they can say for a cover-up. They said he accidentally died and we don't know and the body was disposed and they don't even explain how that happened. And, and this is not a credible story. And, and Turkish intelligence has been leaking to the Turkish press. And, and let's say, OK, Turkey has a political agenda here or some, some bias against Riyadh. But there is evidence. There is evidence like of footage, video footage, for example, uh, showing that a team of hit, hit squad came from Saudi Arabia that day specifically for this. Ultimately, yes, I think they desecrated the body. They torn it into pieces and buried it in different parts of Istanbul. Turkish police is in search of body parts, and if they find that, that will be a f another, you know, blow on the, uh, now we see as the narrative coming from Saudi Arabia. And of course, Turks are, uh, I mean, Turkish sources are speaking of a tape, audio tape, that was uh, allegedly recorded 
uh, inside the consulate. And how, how that came to be, it's not that clear. But if that ta tape exists, and I do think it does based on my context in Turkey and based on what I've heard from other people who might have heard the tape, but if that comes out too, I think that will be the an, another blow. And let's not forget that, for example, today Turkish Daily Inishafat published a very important story as well, apparently based on some leaks from intelligence sources. It's, it, it, they have evidence that the head of the squad uh, who killed Jamal Khashoggi called the secretary of Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman four times that afternoon. That again goes against the. Uh, Narrative we are now hearing from Saudi Arabia that this was a rogue element, a mistake, and the crown prince didn't know, and now he's going for the, after the killers for justice. Uh, yet another reason now this is uh, to think that this is not credible. Well, as we've been hearing during the last, what, 20 days of this saga, international pressure continues to mount. The UK, France and Germany are jointly calling for an urgent clarification of what happened. They say the Saudi investigation needs to be backed by credible facts. The German Chancellor, Angela Merkel, has suspended arms sales to Saudi. First, we condemn this act in the strongest terms, as we made clear yesterday. Second, there is an urgent need to clarify what happened. We're far from having this cleared up and those responsible held to account. Thirdly, I agree with all those who are saying that the, albeit already limited, arms exports can't take place in the current circumstances. Matthew, why are the Germans happy to up the pressure in this way, up the ante? Well, I mean, the Germans or the Europeans have nothing to lose in this. And frankly, the main pressure is on the United States and on Washington. And really, that's what this entire uh, affair gets down to, is what Washington is about to do uh, about this situation. In which case, there might be the type of sanctions, like according to the Magnitsky Act, which is something that was to uh, punish for humanitarian violations uh, that started in the context of Russia. Of course, the U.S. applied those to the Interior and Justice Minister of Turkey when it came to the arrest and detention, ongoing detention of Pastor Brunson. So this is some type of middle ground where the U.S. could sanction uh, some royals, depending on who it would be, and still send a hard message that the U.S. is not going to tolerate such type of behavior, especially against the press. I will say Say, though, that the United States, especially the Trump administration, is quite aware of the deplorable record of many of those who have been in the accusing role right now when it comes to media, especially, of course, how Turkey locks up uh, all kinds of journalists and, of course, Pastor Brunson, as it turned out. So there are really bad records that need to go. The United States might do well to promote a uh, humanitarian type of agenda and a freedom of the press and those type of ideals throughout the region um, as opposed to merely focusing on Saudi Arabia. I mean, let's also remember right now, the Interpol chief uh, has been gone, disappeared, apparently resigned, so we hear from China. Uh, no one really talks about that, and that kind of seems to be something along the exact same lines that we're seeing here. I don't particularly want to get into a but what about these other people conversation, Matthew. I, I think we, we do need to keep this focused on what we're discussing today. Ali Al Ahmed, uh, does King Salman have a clear vision of where he's going with this at the moment? I mean, King Salman, uh, regard, you know, regardless of what you hear in the media, is not uh, in, 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 in the place or capacity to, uh, to run the state. Uh, his uh, health is not well, his age, uh, and uh, he is basically isolated. Uh, he hasn't seen his wife for, for years, and uh, the, uh, his son, Mohammed bin Salman, has control, absolute control over him. Uh, his, uh, he controls his access, so uh, he is, he is the, the, the picture in the frame, but he is not the, uh, the person holding uh, uh, the, the wheel of the, of the state. It is Mohammed bin Salman, you like him or hate him, he is the man in charge and he makes all the decisions. Uh, the father is used as, as a shield here uh, if, if, if Mohammed bin Salman finds it uh, useful. Uh, so uh, um, the king is not in the capacity to make any decision himself. Uh, having said that, I think it's important now uh, with the Western government, uh, it's not enough to rely on Saudi and Turkish investigation. That's why an international investigation, I think, by the UN Security Council to uh, conduct this investigation. And this has a strategic value 
because it's not only going to tell us the truth of what happened and who did what, but also it will uh, go, uh, uh, it will play an important part in, in improving the human rights records of Saudi Arabia and its neighbors, uh, because what happened in Saudi Arabia is a central country that will impact the rest of the, the Muslim uh, world. And another thing is, uh, the, the, this murder happened in the consulate. Uh, which is which is under the control of Adil Jubair, the Saudi foreign minister. So I hope somebody will start talking about what did he know and what was his role, because the council is his employee, and that some of those people in the team were Saudi diplomats. So uh, let's talk about uh, also Adil Jubair, not only MBS, and what he knew about this murder and what was his uh, role in, into it. Mustafa, let's just stay with that talking point that Ali just mentioned there, the Crown Prince, a.k.a. Is also known as MBS, Mohammed bin Salman. What's your reading in amongst this isolation that they are apparently feeling in Riyadh? What's your reading of the way that we're told, it's reported, they may just be leaks, we can't confirm them, that the Crown Prince does feel dismay, he feels anger, he feels confusion, because he apparently completely misread the signals when it was coming to the international reaction to what happened. Yeah, I can imagine. I'm not the biggest expert on Saudi monarchy and its dynamics, but it, I can imagine that the Saudi crown prince is angry at the reactions. But what would, would he expect or what would anybody who does this expect? I mean, I, there is a there's a dynamic here. There is this, the dynamic of this new young crown prince liberalizing his country, doing social reforms, some good reforms indeed that we, we all praised in the past few years. But then uses that to win brownie points in the West and then to crack down on opposition. And this this Jamal Khashoggi murder is not an isolated incident. So we have read uh, reports in the Washington Post that Saudi officials go to Canada and threaten the Saudi dissidents in Canada, saying that, go back. Go back to Saudi Arabia, otherwise your family members will go to jail. And they said, we are giving you the blessings of Crown Prince Salman. So this was going on, and I think he had this naive idea that he can crack down on this sense, silence all his critics, and then make whole, the, the whole world love him. And while well, the world doesn't work that way, luckily, so ultimately the strategy uh, blow, blowed up and it just worked against him. And I want to say one more thing on the whataboutism, I think Matthew voiced. Turkey, my country, is not great on press freedom either, so let's talk honestly about that. And I'm a critic of the journalists who are in jail in Turkey for trumped up charges. The, that, that's the very fact. But, but this is an incident in itself, and something like this is too wild for Turkey. No Turkish journalist has ever been killed, I mean, recently, and in, in his body got lost. And every incident, I think, should be looked at itself. In this case, Turkish officials, Turkish media have been leaking, giving to the press helpful information to show what really happened. Thanks to that, we know that the Saudi squad came from uh, Saudi Arabia that day, 15 men in two private planes, and got the body of Jamal Khashoggi and, and kill, killed him, and now, we, as we understand that. I mean, if that didn't happen, we wouldn't know this. So the states might have their own political interests and posi political positions. They might have own their glass houses, but every incident should be, I think, observed in itself. And at this point in the Jamal Khashoggi incident, we had, a, I think, a state establishment caught bloody uh, red-handed. Matthew, the Crown Prince, we understand, is in charge of reforming his own intelligence services. That means, point number one, how does he do it? And point number two, it also means his father, King Salman, clearly still sees him as heir apparent. Right, yeah. And I think it would be completely ludicrous to think that there would be reform of intelligence uh, agencies that would be open and transparent. I and mean, that goes against everything that an intelligence agency is. So, of course, he's going to be the one who redoes the intelligence agency. I mean, the lesson is, hopefully, that you can't act in such a manner and get away with it without having some form of punishment. But the overall perspective of the United States is, of course, going to be, as you said, focused on the long-term idea of the 2030 reform plan, which the United States stands fully behind. It understands the Trump administration that it's going to occur unevenly. And this is, of course, an extraordinary divergence from that plan. 
Um, but the idea of a reformed, modernized Saudi Arabian society serving as an example for the rest of the region is something very important. And the United States, of course, needs them in a coalition to push back on Iran, which happens to be the number one goal that the president has articulated for the region, which outweighs uh, the idea that some are peddling, which is that the United States should, of course, just sever its relationship with Saudi Arabia and then essentially stab itself in the foot as it comes to its uh, own interests and its foreign policy. Ali Al-Ahmed, uh, Jamal Khashoggi was undoubtedly at the front line of free thought. Has that front line now jumped over the border into Saudi Arabia? Has that front line now found itself inside the inner chambers of the royal palace in Riyadh? Even the, the, uh, what I'm getting from uh, the palace that uh, many are shocked and dismayed and uh, uh, fearful of Mohammed bin Salman and uh, uh, the, the, uh, uh, his, his action on this, uh, you know, by killing and murdering the, the, this uh, Jamal Khashoggi. But uh, Saudi Arabia, supported by the United States, has always uh, silenced critics and executed critics and, and opposition uh, uh, figures. And uh, uh, the Saudi monarchy would not have been able to do this and maintain control and uh, deprive women, for example, from driving to be the last country in the world in cinemas without American support. I want to make sure that the Saudi palace would, would not have been able to, to do what it does without American British support. So I I, dis, I disagree completely with the notion that the U.S. is, is wanting to reform the country. Building uh, some uh, pro projects, an economic project, that's not reform. Otherwise, we should call Mr. Uh, uh, you know, uh, Kim Jong-un in Korea as a reformer because he actually built more uh, uh, you know, buildings in, in North Korea since he took over than Saudi Arabia did. So this is not the uh, re reform. This is Reform is when, when you allow the people a voice, when you allow people participation in the government. That is a reform. But building a project, an uh, uh, industrial project or, or something, that's not reform. These are just merely economic uh, projects. And uh, any, anybody can do that. Okay. Uh, so Ali, I really just want to interrupt you because I just, I just want to get to one final point, if I may. Mustafa, <clears throat> is this yes, a sir. huge wake-up call for the Saudis in as much as do what you want in Yemen, no consequences. Pick a fight with the Canadians, no consequences. Steer the GCC blockade of Qatar, no consequences. Snuff out that one reasonable voice of free speech and do it in the way you allegedly did it. There will be consequences. There should be consequences. And President Trump said there can be severe responses, and that should happen, whatever that is. And I think the U.S. should take a much more tough stance against Saudi Arabia after this incident. I also want to say one more thing. If there will be a genuine reform in Saudi Arabia, that would be turning into a constitutional monarchy, not an absolute monarchy where a young prince can come and grab all the power and kill and silence whomever he wants and make some cosmetic reforms, but a constitutional monarchy where there's an elected parliament, where people can join the system, the balance of the monarchy is, uh, the power of the mo monarchy is balanced, a system like in Morocco or late, late Ottoman Empire. Otherwise, a despotic prince may go, another one may come. Maybe a good prince can go, but somebody else can come. The question is, how do you constrain power in Saudi Arabia and in the rest of the Muslim world? And I think the path for that is structural reform, not just one young prince coming up with some fancy ideas and doing some social cosmetic uh, things, but also butchering his uh, dissidents in, in foreign consulate. That's not acceptable, and I think that's not the kind of reform that we should go for uh, and we should hail, you know, in, in the Muslim world. Gentlemen, we have to leave it there, but thank you so much for your time today. Thanks to all our guests, Ali Al-Ahmed, Matthew Brodsky, and Mustafa Akyol. And thank you to you too for watching. You can see the show again anytime via the website. Al Jazeera.com is the address. And for more discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Peter Dobby, and the team here in Doha, thanks for watching. I'll see you soon. Bye-bye.